I am Ted Hans from Internet2 and the chair of this session. Uh, in terms of housekeeping items this morning, I want to bring to your attention the evaluation form that was in your packet of materials. If you could fill out the evaluation form today and turn it into the GRNet booth near registration, then you will get a gift. So turn in the, you turn in the evaluation form, you get a gift. And that buses today will return back to the hotels uh, shortly after the closing plenary. Well, let's, uh, we're going to, today's next steps. Uh, today we're doing a, mostly a forward looking session in terms of uh, research projects here in Europe that uh, we're talking about some results and also some plans. Our uh, first speaker is Evangelos Maketos from uh, Forth and the University of Crete, who is going to talk to us uh, about the lobster project. Thank you, Evangelos. Oh, thank you, Ted. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Evangelos Markatos. In the next 25 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about a new European project that we are involved in, uh, LOBSTER, which stands for Large-Scale Monitoring of Broadband Internet Infrastructure. Let me start my talk by giving you a roadmap of what I'm going to talk about. In the first part of my talk, I'm going to give you some motivation and explain what is the problem that we are trying to solve. And in a nutshell, the problem is that our understanding of the Internet needs to be improved. Then in the second part of my talk, I'll move into the solution to this problem, the lobster solution. And the solution, in a nutshell, again, it's better internet traffic monitoring through the lobster infrastructure. And finally, I'm going to give you some pointers of how can, you, how can you participate to the lobster consortium. So what is the problem? Basically, the problem is that our understanding of the internet needs to be improved. For example, there are lots of things on the Internet today that we don't know, we suffer, and we witness. For example, we don't know to answer simple questions on the Internet, like uh, which applications generate most traffic. Most system administrators would be interested in finding out which applications generate most traffic or how much traffic a particular application generates. Although this sounds very simple, actually it's a very difficult question to answer. And I'll explain later why it is so difficult, although it seems so simple. Then on the Internet, I'm going to talk about things that we suffer. We continue to suffer malicious attacks, such as viruses and worms, spyware, DOS and DDoS attacks, all those new kinds of attacks that we continue to suffer on the Internet day after day. Uh, day, after day. And finally, on the Internet, we have started witnessing incidents, new peculiar things that we didn't expect and are very difficult to understand. For example, recently, we have started witnessing incidents of friendly fire. And with the term friendly fire, I mean unintentional attacks to major Internet servers, non-malicious attacks to major Internet servers. And basically, our understanding of the Internet needs to be improved, and we need to understand what is going on down there. Now, let me turn your attention to the first of the three problems that I described. And the first problem is the security problem. I said that we continue to suffer malicious cyber attacks, such as viruses, worms, spywares, DOS and DDoS attacks. Actually, cyber attacks continue to plague our networks day after day. Over the last few years, we had several famous worm outbreaks. On the summer of 2001, we had the Code Red Worm, which managed to infect close to 350,000 computers in less than 24 hours. Later, in January 2003, we had the Sapphire Slammer Worm, which managed to infect 70,000 computers in 30 minutes. Imagine that. Imagine this. In less than half an hour, the worm managed to spread all over the globe. And in March 2004, we had another worm, the witty worm, that infected more than 2,000 computers in less than 60 minutes. So why do cyber attacks continue to plague Internet day after day? In order to answer this question, 
we need to understand our basic defense mechanisms against cyber attacks. And defense mechanisms against cyber attacks consist of detection of the cyber attacks, identification of the cyber attack, and deployment of the defense mechanism. Now let me take this one at a time. Detection. In order to defend ourselves against the cyber attacks, we first need to detect them. We first need to detect that we are under attack. Again, although this sounds very simple, actually it's very complicated to detect a cyber attack. It may take a lot of time, usually take from several minutes, if it is automated, up to a few hours, if it is manual. Then we need to identify the attack. We need to fingerprint the attack. We need to describe it in sufficient detail so as automated systems like firewalls and intrusion detection systems will be able to recognize the attack. Usually the result of identification or fingerprinting is a signature, an intrusion detection system signature, or a firewall rule that can be deployed to intrusion detection systems and firewalls in order so that the systems and firewalls are able to detect the attack if they are attacked. And then, once we generate these rules, we need to deploy the rules and the signatures to firewalls and intrusion detection systems. So, in summary, overall, cyber attack response consists of detection, identification, and response, which in total may take several hours. Which means, I said previously, that some of the cyber attacks manage to cover the entire globe in 30 minutes, in 60 minutes, generally in less than an hour. So it means that cyber attacks response is initiated after almost all computers have been infected because the response takes several hours and the attack is over in less than an hour. It's over. So response to the attack is initiated after the attack is practically over. And the question that we need to answer here is, can we start cyber attack response before all computers have been infected, not after all computers have been infected as is being done today? So the answer is that can we start response before all computers have been infected? Yes, but it is difficult. We need smart internet traffic monitoring sensors and a distributed infrastructure of internet traffic sensors. We need smarter internet traffic monitoring. We need sensors capable of detecting new worms. And we also need a network of such sensors, an infrastructure of such sensors. And the infrastructure of sensors will be more sensitive to, attack, to attacks than its individual sensors. An infrastructure of such sensors will be able to pinpoint attacks as soon as they emerge because they all cooperate with each other. And they will be able to spread information about new worms much faster. Now, let me turn your attention to the second problem that we don't understand and we need to understand better. The first problem was security. The second problem is that we don't know which applications generate most traffic. And basically, we don't know lots of traffic accounting um, issues. Now, let me have a, uh, I have a picture up there from the traffic of the University of Wisconsin for a week early this year. And the traffic, and uh, the picture is here, shows the categorization of traffic in different applications. So we see that the red corresponds to web application, it's the HTTP. The green corresponds to the FTP application. And some other colors, like the purple here, corresponds to CASA applications. Uh, some light yellow, which practically cannot be seen, corresponds to Nutella applications and so on. But the most interesting thing to see from this picture is that other applications account for 69% of the total traffic. And other means that non-peer-to-peer, non-World Wide Web, non-FTP, not news, not real audio, no email, no ICMP, nothing of the known applications. So basically, practically 70% of the traffic cannot be categorized into the known applications. So it's practically 69 or 70 percent of the traffic is unaccounted for. We cannot categorize it into known applications. Maybe it belongs to peer-to-peer -peer applications that use dynamic ports. 
Maybe it belongs to media applications. But the bottom line is that we don't know how to categorize this traffic. So we need to improve our understanding of the Internet. If we are going to do effective accounting of the Internet, we need to improve our understanding. Now let me turn your attention to the third problem that I described, the peculiar incidents, the incidents of friendly fire, the incidents that we did not expect and we found on the Internet. Uh, here I have a graph on the traffic of the DNS servers. I assume you all are aware of the DNS servers, which are basically a network of servers on the Internet that translate names of computers, domain names, into IP addresses. It's much like a telephone directory that associates names of people with telephone numbers. So uh, this network of DNS servers is essential to work, otherwise we will not be able to access the Internet using the names, the domain names of the computers. So usually this network is robust and has reasonable traffic. It has been engineered to uh, sustain its traffic. But uh, people that were doing network monitoring for DNS servers suddenly saw that very sudden increases in traffic. A sudden increase here, and then regular traffic again, and then a sudden increase there, and then regular traffic again. The increase is an order of magnitude more traffic than the, than the regular traffic that the DNS servers uh, have. And that increase, it was not the result of an attack. Uh, the DNS servers, they were not under attack. It was not something malicious. The problem was traced to Windows 2000 and Windows XP computers, which suddenly, several of them, at the same time, they started updating root DNS servers. They started to send legitimate traffic to DNS servers. It was not a hostile attack. It was not a malicious attack. It was probably something in their software that made the several of them at the same time to send messages to root DNA servers and practically created significant load, which is equivalent to a denial of service attack. And it is not clear why that happened or how we can protect ourselves from such legitimate events in the future. So what do all these mean? I described things that, about security that we need to be faster, about traffic monitoring that we cannot categorize, about the friendly fire that we don't understand. What do all these mean? What do all these have in common? And all this means that our understanding of the Internet needs to be improved. There are lots of things out there that we don't understand, and we should do something in order to understand them better. It means that there is a gap a gap between what we measure and understand and what's really going on down there. And there, this gap is very large, and it's probably getting larger. And I have a picture here that visualizes this gap. The picture is again from the University of Wisconsin, but uh, again traffic categorization, but over a two-year period. When you see color is traffic that was successfully attributed to applications, so here we have the purple again, the Kazaa, lots of traffic was attributed to the Kazaa application. Uh, the red was web application, green was FTP application, light yellow was Nutella applications, and so on. And this white space here is the gap, the thing that we cannot categorize, the portion of the traffic that we cannot understand. And we see that as time goes by from 2002 all the way up to 2004, the gap increases. It's starting being small, and currently it is very large, and it is dominating our traffic. And the gap between what we know and what's going on down there continues to widen with time. And we should do something. We should do something in order to stop this increase and maybe reverse it and decrease the gap, if possible. So what's the solution to better understanding of internet traffic monitoring, basically we need better internet traffic monitoring. And by better I mean faster, faster traffic monitoring. We need to detect worms, for example, before they infect the planet. We need to detect things fast in real time. And second, we need more accurate traffic monitoring. For example, I saw previously the gap between the traffic that we understand 
and the total traffic going on down there, and we need more accurate traffic monitoring in order to close the gap between what we measure and what's going on. And how are we going to do that? The solution is better internet traffic monitoring. And better internet traffic monitoring, we believe within Lobster, should be based on two principles. The first principle is distributed collaboration. Distributed collaboration among traffic monitoring sensors. Basically, we need a network of such sensors, an infrastructure, if you like it, of such sensors that collaborate with each other, that exchange information, and they collaboratively try to understand internet traffic faster and better. And second, we need to base our solution into state-of-the-art research, much like the research that we are currently doing within the SCAMPI uh, project, where we build a passive network traffic monitoring system, the SCAMPI monitoring system. I have just one slide for SCAMPI in order to give you a broad idea of what SCAMPI is doing. And basically, SCAMPI is doing high-performance network traffic monitoring. It builds passive network traffic monitoring for high-speed networks. It is currently developing a high-performance programmable FPGA-based monitoring card that is able to do passive monitoring in 10 gigabit per second networks. It provides a flexible programming environment, which we call MAPI, Monitoring Application Programming Interface, MAPI, which allows the, the user, the programmer, to program the SCAMPI adapters, but to program any kind of monitoring adapter, including uh, commodity adapters or uh, end days adapters, the DAG cards, uh, and so on. And uh, also, SCAMPI is doing highly effective intrusion detection algorithms and highly effective system architectures for intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems. The, uh, not me, not, let me close the parenthesis about SCAMP and go back into Lobster again. Uh, I tell you that Lobster is a network of passive internet traffic monitoring, monitors which collaborate, they exchange information and observations, and they can correlate results in order to do faster and more accurate internet traffic monitoring. Lobster is a specific support action. It is funded by the European Commission, and it's a two-year project, which currently it is expected to start in October 1st of this year, and it is expected to end in late 2006. The Lobster partners are research organizations, NRNs, ISPs, and associations of NRNs, and industrial partners. The research partners are ICS4, where I come from, the Vrij University from the Netherlands and TNO Telecom from the Netherlands. The NRNs are Cessnet from Czech Republic and Uninet from Norway. Uh, Fourthnet is an ISP from Greece and Terena, which is the European Network Association of NRN, for NRNs from the Netherlands. And we also have two industrial partners in the project, Alcatel and Endays. Uh, what do we think are the challenging issues about Lobster? What is difficult about building such a network of passive monitors? The first challenging issue is trust. And it means that cooperating sensors may want to cooperate, but may not trust each other. For example, some sensors may collect private data. They may collect confidential data. And although they would like to cooperate, they don't want to reveal private and confidential data. And the solution we plan to use within Lobster is anonymization. Basically, you're going to anonymize the data, sanitize the data, or encrypt the data, if you like, and outside users will be able to operate only on anonymized or sanitized data. What is another challenging issue? Another challenging issue is that we need a common programming environment. Imagine that we'll have all those different more passive monitor sensors all over Europe, and they may be heterogeneous, they may have been produced by different manufacturers. We need a common programming environment to program all of them and to coordinate all of them. And within Lobster, we plan to develop DMAPI, which stands for Distributed MAPI. Remember, MAPI is the monitoring application programming interface which has been developed within SCAMPI. And within Lobster, we plan to extend it into a distributed environment. Using MAPI, a user is able to program a single sensor, a single passive monitor. Using DMAPI, the distributed MAPI, a user is able to program a set of such sensors, a network of such sensors. 
And the third challenging issue that we plan to address within Lobster is resilience to attackers. What if intruders penetrate Lobster? It is theoretically possible that some intruders will attack Lobster, and it is again theoretically possible that some intruders will manage to penetrate Lobster. What will happen then? Will the intruders have access to private or confidential data? We believe that the answer will be no. Intruders will not have access to private and confidential data. In order to do that, we would like to do hardware anonymization. So the card that gathers the data will do a first level anonymization, first level sanitation of the data, so as the data that will be stored in the computer will never be in clear text ASCII form. They will always be in a sanitized form. The level of, actually, the level of sanitization or anonymization will be tuned by system administrators so as to enforce very strong anonymization or very light anonymization depending on what they want. And let, uh, now let me talk about a few potential lobster applications. One potential lobster application is traffic monitoring. I saw two pictures from the University of Wisconsin traffic and we saw that there is a gap there between what we can measure today, what we can attribute, and what's really going on down, down there. And we really believe that we need more accurate traffic monitoring. We would like to be able to answer questions such as, how much of my bandwidth is going to file sharing applications, such as Nutella or Kaza, and so on. We believe that traffic monitoring will be one of the important applications that will be run on top of Lobster. Other traffic monitoring questions? Which applications generate most of the traffic? Although this sounds a very simple question, actually it's very hard today to answer such questions using the tools that we have. Other type of uh, applications on top of Lobster. Early warning systems. For example, Lobster will contribute to automatic detection of new worms, zero-day worms, novel worms, not known worms, but novel worms, unknown worms, worms that now spread through the Internet. Lobster can contribute to an early warning system by detecting worms within minutes. All those different lobster sensors may be able to collaborate with each other. They may exchange information. And if one of them is hit by a worm, then that one will send the information to other sensors as well. Or if the worm is stealth, that means it generates very little traffic in order not to be detected, that worm may be difficult to detect by having only a single sensor, but if we correlate information from several different sensors, we'll be able to have more accurate information about the worm and may be able to detect it faster. And so Lobster may facilitate the early response to worm actually before they infect all computers. Remember that the problem that I described previously about the cyber attacks that we suffer today is that we start response practically after the cyber attack is over. Because the cyber attacks last only for a few minutes, say 30 minutes, while response may last for several hours. And we need to reduce the response time. And the first thing that we need to do in order to reduce response time is that we need to detect worms faster. Other kinds of applications, grid computing, what I call here grid performance debugging. Currently, more and more applications are grid-enabled, which means that they can, run, they can run over a grid and they can collaborate several distributed components that are geographically distributed all over the globe. For example, the application may run on supercomputer in Europe and they may use instruments in the United States and they may use data in database that they may exist in Asia. And all those different components collaborate with each other over the grid and contribute towards the execution of a single application. Grid-enabled applications access remote data, remote resources like sensors and instruments, and remote computing power. So it is possible that some of the application, some portions of the application do not perform very well. Uh, their performance are not as expected. So uh, if there is a problem with the application, how can the user figure out what the problem is? If the application is slow, how can the user figure out what's the problem with the application? Is it the problem of the local area network, the wide area network, the remote area network, or is it the problem of the local computer that is too slow maybe, or a remote server or a middleware server? 
These are very difficult questions to answer today, and we believe that with infrastructure such as Lobster, we may be able to answer such questions better. Now, who can benefit from Lobster? We believe that NRNs and ISPs will definitely benefit from Lobster because we'll have better internet traffic monitoring of their networks, better understanding of their interactions with other NRNs and ISPs. Security researchers will also benefit from an infrastructure such as Lobster. Security researchers will have access to anonymized data and will also have access to an anonymized test bed. They will be able to make experiments, real-time experiments, and study trends and validate theories about cybersecurity, validate theories about how the worms spread and how they can be effectively contained. Also, network and security administrators will definitely benefit from an infrastructure such as Lobster. For example, they will have access to a traffic monitoring infrastructure, Lobster itself. They will have access to early warning system for worms and cyber attacks. And last but not least, they will also have access to software and tools that will be developed within Lobster in order to, monitors network, to monitor networks better. So how can you get involved? Uh, we have started an email list. It's lobster-news at ICS4GR. And you can join this mailing list uh, by sending an email to lobster-news-request at ics.forth.gr. We subject subscribe. Uh, or if you, are an, if you are an NRN or an ISP or an organization that has a large network to run, you may join the infrastructure. We expect the infrastructure to be operational in late 2005, and outside members will be able to join the infrastructure, for, the infrastructure from early 2006. So, summary. Let me now summarize and close my talk. Basically, uh, the punchline of the talk is that our understanding of the Internet needs to be improved. There are lots of things out there that we don't understand, we would like to understand, and we should do something about understanding them. Our understanding of the Internet needs to be improved. And we plan to do that through Lobster. And Lobster will provide better Internet traffic monitoring, which will be based on a network of passive monitoring sensors, and state-of-the-art scampi research. Lobster will also provide trusted cooperation in an untrusted world. This is the anonymization that I was talking pre about previously. A common programming platform, which is the DMAPI, the distributed MAPI, and resilience to attackers, which is again hardware anonymization so that the computer does not store or transfer clear text data. And if you are interested in following Lobster uh, events, join our emailing list. Lobster does news does request at ics.forth.cr. And this concludes my talk. I think we have time for a few questions. We do have time for questions. Yes, Maro. Yeah, uh, I'm going to repeat the question for the broadcasting. The question is, what is the relation of the Lobster project and GN2? Actually, there is close collaboration between Lobster and GN2. Some of the partners, like uh, the NRNs, are uh, common between the two projects. Uh, GN2, I know they plan to use SCAMPI, which we also plan to use SCAMPI results as well. And there is, uh, there is going to be collaboration in the future in the, in the sense that besides the two NRNs that are already partners of Lobster, we will expect other NRNs to join the Lobster infrastructure. Uh, if GN2 builds a similar infrastructure, there will also be cooperation, exchange of data, and things like that. But we intend to have a close co collaboration with them. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Evangelist.
So continue, continuing on our theme of, of clever project names, we move from lobster to Muppet. The, uh, not so, yeah, not very clever in English. Yeah. Uh, Mauro Campanella joins us from GAR, the, Ita the Italian Research Network, and will talk to us about Muppet. Mauro. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Um, I think that I, it should be nice to add some slides in front of the, just the presentation of the MAPET project to make clear why a project like MAPET has been proposed by ANRNs and telcos. So the point is the network control plane. Why interest? There is a lot of interest in ongoing research and testing on this issue. What, what is an art con control plane for? Well, one of the main issues is that um, researchers and large projects like EG are requesting bandwidth on demand. That means that the static network is no longer enough to satisfy the requirements of the users. This is not just for grids, but also the possibility to reserve bandwidth for a definite time for video conferencing. I mean, people are starting to want more dynamic networks. In addition to that, people want also to have end-to-end -end performance guarantees. End-to-end -end is a terminology used in internet and is usually meant, if you think at the traditional internet IP layer, between the uh, sending NIC and the receiving NIC of the two hosts. That means it doesn't take into account the operating system nor the applications involved. Nonetheless, uh, the end-to-end -end performance from the network point of view is of large interest to a lot of people. Why thinking at these kind of things and thinking that they can be a viable today is possible because of fiber abundance and IWDM. Now we have enough circuits and enough fibers, not everywhere, not always, unfortunately, but nonetheless it is possible really to think that a multiplicity of circuits can be created. In addition to that, that means fiber abundance and DWDM means that we are looking not just to the traditional packet switcher data network, but we are going to use in some way a mixed packet and circuit switch network. And the network control plane will be essential to harmonize the two. An example of real needs now is high energy physics, radio telescope, high definition TV. All these issues may require a slightly different approach than the past. So just my personal review of what's going on now in the architectures. This is the traditional uh, control protocols layering. Sorry for the misalignment, that is Mac OS towards Windows. Nothing to do with me. Um, well, application, uh, we will never talk about application in this talk. Um, these are the usual lists. Just to let you know that we do have some network control protocols already deployed, although we, we may not know it, and some of them interact one to each other. SNMMP and RSVP may span multiple layers. And indeed, we, using these kind of protocols, we can indeed configure part of the network to a reasonable extent. These are the traditional telcos, uh, control planes, um, protocols or architectures, and so on. As you can see, we have always a differentiation between data link and physical relating to telcos and the upper layers relating to the internet model. Oh, here the disalignment is even larger, sorry. <laughs> uh, anyway, I think you, you will understand what is. Um, here I try to map the control architectures. These are the, before in the previous slide we had the protocols, now we have the architectures. Uh, internet is historically always interested more in the 
layers in the upper layers and in the layers up to the network layer and is less interested in data link, transport and physical. Uh, we have this new uh, architecture proposed by ITUT and other bodies which is called ASIN. GMPLS is a mixture. GMPLS um, has started with multi-protocol label switching as you know and it's interesting for the network point of view from the IP layer, but nonetheless uh, is extension to generalize an MPLS, which is a subset of the standard MPLS. Also is capable of, in principle, of going down to the physical layer in the sense of um, talking with hardware that may light some fibers with some particular wavelengths. Um, I, I put a distance, a difference a wall like it too because traditionally up to now ASON and GMPLS actually although very similar do not map one to one exactly and so this is one of the issues being addressed now. Uh, the latest control architecture which is being proposed by grid people is web services and the main difference in my opinion is that while the others tend to be horizontal control layers, if you want. The web services tend to be a vertical approach, approach to the control plane. The QoS is always there. I use it the Spanish way of saying, well, we don't know. Is it really needed? Is it isn't? Should be explicitly part of the control plane architectures? Most of the people think yes. Uh, I won't deal with that question, but just to let you know that it's there, it may be a large influence everywhere. Um, producing these kind of control architectures that actually talks to every layer and actually does bandwidth on demand, for example, might not be easy for a lot of issues. Uh, the main challenge is if you really want end-to-end, -end, I wrote worldwide, but thinking just at Europe and Jian, Europe and Jian means at least 35, 40 different administrative and management domains. So even if we just stay in Europe, then we need to go through multi-domain environment. And our researchers are very keen to communicate with United States labs and other China labs and so on. So the challenge of AEA is one of the key issues. Stacking of different protocols. If you really stack PNNI and then you try to use BGP on top of it and OSPI, the time of just to be here pick up a simple example, the timers of BGP, PNNI, SGH not always match in the correct way. For example, you may have an automatic optical rerouting, but then it might be too short or too long for BGP or for SGH to kick in. Signaling protocols, yes, signaling works on a single domain, but what happens if we have a multi-domain environment in which the end-to-end -end run trip times are of the order of 100 of 1 milliseconds. Then, if you think that signaling means at least the exchange of from 5 to 10 packets, and each exchange is one RTT, we are talking about seconds. Scaling, that's obvious. Routing architectures, yes, but if you now have the ability to create loads of circuits, which means loads of different paths in the network. How do you route on this highly meshed network? Resource brokers, because if you really uh, want to um, use the network in such an, in, let's say, distributed and dynamic way, then you have to have someone who takes into account and remembers what's going on. Information system, how to find the, the names of the system you, have going, you are going to, to look for. And time quantum, I already talked about it in about signaling protocol, when what real time means if you have to quantify that for your users. I'm not saying that you have to sign an, a an SLA and say, I will, uh, in any case, fulfill your request in five seconds. That might be not the case. But in any case, it's good to know that there is a hard limit which none of the signaling protocols can go over. Ongoing research, I will just 
briefly list and have few slides on what's going on. For, so if people is interested, this is the borders of and the collaborating, collaboration, possible collaboration for the Muppet project. Canaria, you already have had maybe the uh, possibility to, talk, to, to listen to the talk of uh, Bill Santano, user controller light path. In Internet 2, there is Hopi, the hybrid optical and packet infrastructure. Giant is now moving to the GN2, and GN2 has a specific joint research activities. This is what JRA means. Joint research activity is about bandwidth on demand and these dynamic control network, control protocol networks. And I just list two projects because this is one in the United States, Dragon. I, both these projects are just starting, so there is uh, not, much, not much documentation available on the web. Nonetheless, for Dragon, I listed a pointer to the presentation making for the data tag at CERN uh, one month ago, two months ago. And then I will now talk to you about MAPAD. So this is the framework we want to work in. Um, which are the, the possible solutions? Just to remind you about what Canaria is doing. Canaria, the, the, the central sentence is no central control plane. This is the Canary approach. They really want the users to be able to have each, each a different control plane. Each of them is capable of creating a different network. And how they do that? Well, they just put equipment there. They have an AAA infrastructure and they allow the users to control by themselves the network equipment and to create the networks by, them, by themselves. The, the idea is that in that case, you, in principle, do not need MPLS. That, that's one of the key issues. They, they, play, they, they are control plane. It's something very thin which directly access the network hardware. This is an example of what they were capable to do in the last month. They wanted to connect Taiwan to Ireland using what they call a light path. Um, don't ask me a definition, but in principle, this is something like a very specific circuit with a sure bandwidth from Taiwan to Ireland. And they actually did that using the, some software they produced, the user-controlled light path software produced by the, at least three different universities in Canada. They went through Internet 2. They used it a wavelength inside CA star net 4 and they reach it through New York Island. So in principle with a minimum amount of software it is already now possible to create something. Obviously this is not a solution which can easily scale. It has to be still worked on. This is an example of what it might happen in Giant. You may have as I told you before, many different domains, Giant itself, each NRN, the campus IP, the last mile, which is as much important as the core backbone. And then you may want to have a domain controller for this network control plane, which talks using whatever protocol you want to the hardware to set up and tear down and check what's going on in the network. Muppet. Uh, Muppet is, has just been uh, approved a few weeks ago. I mean, the latest signature with European commissions and so on have been placed in, on paper. And so what I will tell you is just the idea of what Muppet is doing, which is complementary to the other type of research. The main goal is to focus on GMPLS. This is because we will see we have a mixture of NRNs and telcos. And uh, for, especially for telcos, the ASIN environment and the GMPLS environment looks very appealing. And so we think it's very important in any case
to really try to understand if that is a feasible solution and, and up to which extent the NRN can really use and profit of this technology. Uh, the idea is that if you really want to use GMPLS and ASIN on a large scale, because this is the goal for us, we immediately need something multi-domain, then we have to have a test bed which is large enough and diverse enough to really test this technology. This is what you can think of as the basic architecture. Uh, that reflects very well the fact that we may have what the standard uh, service providers call the transport layer. Why for me, which I, I'm internet-based, uh, transport is TCP, for them is anything below IP. So we have the transport layer, we have the IP, MPLS, and TCP layer on top, but the goal of the MAP project is creating this large experimental environment and see if it is possible to, in this multi-layer network, use GMPLS to really harmonize all the requirements of the different layers and control the network in the appropriate way. It has to be noted that the current specs, ITF specs or ITUT specs for ASIN and GMPLS mainly focus on single domain. So up to now, GMPLS may be profitably used for something in the single domain, but the multi-domain part is still missing. So MAPET will mainly focus on multi-domain, while other project, large projects like Noble, maybe you have heard about it, will mainly focus on single domain and really exploit GMPLS technology on the single domain. So the idea is to create a test bed, something like these, how these clouds show you, in which we may have Network carriers A, network carriers B, with dedicated GMPLS machines and extension to the standard GMPLS, for example, to inhibit the possibility for carrier A to look at in the details of carrier B network. But at the same time, we want to have a client network which can directly connect to the clouds and do something on demand. This is an example of the institution involved and of the type of labs we will have. We will mainly have two, three to four uh, test beds. One of the interesting aspects of MAPET is that almost all these test beds already exist. Being already there is just, uh, uh, just connecting them, which may uh, be needed in the first phase, and we plan to connect this test bed, let's say, essentially Spain with Rodiris and the uh, Spanish Telecom, Italy with Italian Telecom and GAR, uh, Germany, Poland, and the Northern European test bed. We plan to start almost from day one, if you want, because the infrastructure is already there using MPLS circuits on Giant itself, and then add specific circuits, maybe <coughs> on optical fibers, later, when it's really needed to do something at that layer. As you can see, on the right-hand side, we may want to use very different technologies, both at the physical layer and at the data link layer because this is what is happening. I mean, we will never have the same equipment all over Europe. We will never have, have the same data link technology all over Europe. So we need to look in detail on how it's possible to use at least three or four or five different technologies at the same time in a profitable way. This is, in more detail, the consortium. The project coordinator is Marconi mainly the, you know, from the German part. Equipment manufacturers, there is also Juniper involved. Uh, Juniper, as you may have noticed, is very keen in uh, and very convinced that GMPLS is the right way to go. 
to control everything. And so it's a natural addition to this kind of project. Network operators, essentially Italy, Germany, and Spain, and some research centers and NRNs. Between the NRNs, it's Italy, uh, Germany, Poland, and Spain. And the other are research centers inside each university. So, just to summarize a little bit what MAPPET is about, we leverage existing test beds. In particular, in Italy, we leverage the lab of uh, Telecom Italia lab, which produced the LION project. People that have had time to look at the optical research in the last years may know LION. LION was focused on purely optical switching in a large part, and they did a lot of work exactly in the interaction of different protocols at the optical layer, the data link layer, and the IP layer. So we leverage the experience. T-Systems is also uh, quite diverse and large in terms of equipment and capabilities. They are obviously the users, because we do these for users. I mean, uh, the other end are these, at the same time, carriers and users in, on behalf of their research community. So we need users. The users are there through a CREO, but also, for example, PSMC has a lot of interesting application or grid application, and it is involved in the grid applications. IPMPLS, that is just to stress the fact that we need to integrate the, the two different sets of layers. What we may leverage is also that being on our ends we already have requests from grid people or from other projects to use such a test bed to test the viability, for example, of grid network brokers, grid network resources, and so on. So what we think MAPET can provide as useful information and maybe outcome, essentially, we really want to exploit the possibility to use GMPLS for a user control of network resources. This is very similar to what Canary is doing, just we exploit a different technology. User control network resources means that we want to offer the users the possibility to have to create broadband on demand, including QoS guarantees. Uh, obviously, everyone talks about bandwidth on demand. But if you really ask the users what this bandwidth means, it means, it means assured bandwidth. No one is really interested in best effort bandwidth from A to B because this is what the current production environment offers the, the users. So usually they really mean a, a, a limited but fixed amount of capacity. Network providers, what they expect to reach from MAPET project, well, uh, spend less money and get more, obviously, which means a better way of handling all the equipment they have, simplification of operational processes, efficient network solutions leading to cost savings. That means that you can have a lower number of protocols integrate better the IP, data, and telephony world on the existing infrastructure. And obviously, an open platform. Finally, um, the requirements to have an openness of the platform itself so that it's easier to talk with other carriers, it's easier to talk to the users, so that new services can be created in a short amount of time is becoming paramount also for service providers. And obviously end-to-end -end services. I was just talking yesterday with Kireti Compella of Juniper, and uh, we agreed that just now, the ITF and ITUT community is working on multi-domain GMPLS. So this is really a research topic, and we really need to work hard to be sure that the uh, multi-domain extension of MPLS fits our needs. Network requirements, well, we can do that, provided that the network vendors implement these functionalities in the network devices, and the functionalities can seem seamless, 
collaborate between different vendors, which this is one of the key issues. I mean, we have, for example, Juniper and Cisco and other equipment. If we do some traffic extension to OSPF or other protocols, these traffic extensions, traffic engineering extension, should be compatible between all the vendors. That means that the standardization procedures and the standardization effort in this kind of project must be very large to ensure exactly that we are not restricted to one vendor or one carrier. And obviously, we want to prove in practice, in the reality, in our networks, that these solutions are good enough. That's it. Do we have any questions? Yes. If you're referring to the fact that, for example, the number of bits of QS bits in MPLS and in the SCP is different, then it's fine. So, uh, indeed, MPLS has a lower number of classes than the standard IP v4 and IP6. So, this is one of the parts which has to be looked at. The idea is that QS may mean many different things. In principle, if you just provide a circuit, physical circuit, that automatically provides their users with physical QS. Then they, if the users misuses the circuit at the packet layer, then you don't have any QS. But in principle, it's possible to look at the different way of providing QS at the packet level, at the circuit level, and try to understand if that fits the user requirements. So uh, since I'm doing the project, I don't have the answer now. <laughs> Did, did you want to clarify that more, that question? Or? Oh, do you want to get the microphone so... The basic idea uh, was that in um, like QS in uh, optical, let's say, um, LSP could be um, that uh, you need something like a predefined amount of... Um, uh, availability so that when that phase you have a uh, protection so that can be a QS on a light path however this means nothing for a uh, IP uh, LSP which is of course what you said before I mean uh, the legacy QS for a packet uh, network how are you going to integrate or uh, th this kind of different uh, approaches um, I can't but agree the, the, the two things are really different. And the example I made, which is, okay, you can just provide a circuit to the users, but this is, tells the users nothing about the, his capability of correctly using the circuit at the packet layer, I think is intrinsic. I mean, you just provide a 10 gig wavelength to a user, but then if a user tries to inject 11 gigabit of, of uh, packets to the 10 gigabit circuit, congestion will occur. So I think that QS is, again, a multi-layer thing. The important thing is to try to harmonize the approach and try to say, to, to define how QS is, has been dealt in. And at the same time, I agree, for example, QS from the circuit point of view is something like you can think about bit error rate, you can think about um, resiliency or uptime and so on, which is very different from what we are used in the packet environment in which we think at how much, how many, how much capacity do I have, how, how long is the run trip times, and so on. The two worlds need to be uh, closely put together to get the final network end to end. And that's a tough task. I agree. We will work on that. Any other questions?
Okay, let's, thanks again. Our next speaker is uh, Tanya Politi, who joins us from the Optimist Project. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. In this uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about the advanced optical network research uh, that has been going on in the EU Information Society Technology Program, and as it was seen through the Framework 5 Optimist and Framework 6 um, BREAD projects. Now, my name is Tanya Politi, and I am with the University of Essex. However, this uh, presentation is on behalf of a large group of people, uh, the name of which you can see listed here, and they come from a large group of uh, research institutes, nine in number, um, consultancy companies, etc. Uh, however, the projects that were involved in this presentation and the results that I'm going to present are coming from different IST projects, and uh, I would like to acknowledge the coordinators and partners. So uh, the, um, um, the Optimist project and the BREAD project co cover an overall timeline from the beginning of the Framework 5, and uh, this was actually um, a follow-up from the Framework 4 Horizon Coordination Action, and it will be evolving in the next Framework 6 uh, program. Uh, these two projects are actually coordination activities, and uh, we, uh, what that means is that they uh, are involved in uh, disseminating information in a specific thematic network, but also uh, do some road mapping activities for this specific group. Uh, so the Optimist project started around in the beginning of uh, 2000 and will end soon, by the end of June actually, while the BREAD project has started in uh, the beginning of 2004 and will end by the end of 2006. And this is going to be uh, approximately the outline of my talk. I will present some of the results uh, of the Framework 5 projects and some of the expected results of the Framework 6 projects. So the Optimus Coordination Action in Framework 5 was involved with the thematic network of projects that they were related with advanced photonic uh, materials and technologies, advanced photonic um, subsystems, and advanced photonic uh, networking technologies. So just to, to give some of the main objectives of this project, it was to initiate and manage this thematic network and cluster these uh, research and development projects that they were active in the area of photonics, and uh, through that it has the interproject uh, col collaboration. But at the same time, it had to disseminate the results and the strategies of the cluster within the cluster, but also enhance uh, the external interactions of this project with other photonic activities, uh, not only at the national level, but also at the international level. And one of the main activities of the project was also to um, create the, op the European Roadmap for Optical Communications together with the technology trend documents in uh, photonic technologies and optical networking. So, as I said already, the Framework 5 is drawing uh, to a close, and uh, in overall, and in this area of photonic technologies, there were approximately 60 projects funded. Um, some of them were related to the optical networking. These projects were spread across the access, the metro, the wide area layers of the network, and uh, I'm not going to talk about the access part of the network at this point, because it's a main issue in the new framework, the Framework 6. Uh, but the projects that were involved in metro and wide area, they were mainly involved with trying to enhance the flexibility and the granularity of these networks. So, for example, the IST Lion project that Mauro uh, mentioned before uh, was involved in uh, um, developing dynamic circuit switching, while the David and Stolas project were involved with optical packet and optical burst switching. Uh, most of these projects have already finished. They had their final demonstrators. Um, some of them are going to finish soon. And there is also another group of projects related to um, high bit rate transmission. So just to give some examples of these projects, the Lion project is shown here. It was a consortium that was led by Telecom Italia. And it actually designed and developed a, an intelligent optical network based on an autom automatic switched optical network with generalized MPLS. And uh, now in the course of this project, uh, uh, there was the design and deployment of the management and control planes, the network network interfaces and user network interfaces. 
uh, together with other studies like for traffic and uh, using Asian for survivability, etc. Uh, they had a demonstrator at the end, uh, which actually showed the interconnection of three optical networking domains uh, coming from the three different uh, partners, Siemens, T-Lab, and Tellium, and at the same time the network management system uh, from T-Nova and Cisco. Uh, this uh, uh, demonstrator, this testbed, had uh, optical cross-connect and optical ladder multiplexes interconnected. It showed their signaling interfaces and uh, performed some uh, restoration capabilities and, of course, uh, fast uh, um, path setup and tear down. Another main issue in uh, Europe is the optical bell switching, and um, this is because it's a, a method uh, that it's actually adding a lot of flexibility in the network without um, pushing the technology too greatly. So uh, it's uh, been represented in many uh, national research projects and also in the new framework, but in the framework five, uh, it's the STOLAS that was dealing with optical bell switching, this project that is shown in the slide. Uh, STOLAS project were actually investigating how to do the optical label switched um, network and uh, it had to, uh, it's actually investigating uh, the best way to do functions like routing, monitoring and control. Um, in the course of this project there were some key components and uh, technologies like for example the core router or the edge router where the burst uh, was aggregated and uh, they were developed and um, there were also some uh, um, this specific network architecture was tested under uh, realistic traffic input scenarios. Uh, this project is still running and they will have the demonstrator by the end of this year. Now, as I said before, there are some high bitrate uh, transmission IST projects. They are either involved with optical time division multiplexing um, high bitrate transmission or a combination of WDM and OTDM. Uh, one of these uh, projects, Fashion, excuse me, <coughs> It's a small consortium, and it actually had a demonstrator of 160, uh, and 160 gigabits per second in an installed fiber of the UK network. Uh, it used optical time division multiplexing, and uh, they see a possible um, application of this uh, high bitrate transmission to the metro part of the network, as it's expected to have a, a large uh, capacity demand. So the schematic shows um, the demonstrator. Uh, it was between the Ipswich telephone exchange and the New Market telephone exchange, which was uh, 69 kilometers away. Uh, 16 channels, it's um, uh, modulated at 10 gigabits per second. They were all um, multiplexed together. Uh, they were transmitting down the fiber at New Market. They, there was some uh, dispersion compensation uh, applied on the signal, and then uh, the signal would go back to Ipswich where one of the channels was dropped and another was added. And the overall transmission was of uh, 280 kilometers. It was an, a very good uh, demonstration in the beginning of this year. Another um, high bit rate project is the top rate project that actually suggesting to fill up the fiber with uh, a combination of OTDM and dense WDM. And uh, the way to do this, as they suggest, is uh, use ETDM, which is mature enough for 40 gigabits per second, then uh, multiplex with OTDM four channels to create 160 gigabits per second, and then increase the capacity of the fiber with multiple wavelengths at 160 gigabits per second. So in order to do this, they have already demonstrated um, dispersion management optimization and fiber transmission of, uh, for one channel at 160 gigabits per second and four channels at the same time. And uh, they developed and investigated many novel uh, techniques uh, like for polarization mode dispersion compensation, electronic 40 gigabits per second eye monitoring, optical, the multiplexing using um, crystal fibers and uh, optical clock recovery. But uh, at the same time, there are some uh, projects at national level. I will give uh, two examples here. One is this that is uh, funded, uh, there are two projects actually, Obstant and Operon, that they are funded uh, by the UK National Research Council, EPSRC. And the scope of this project is to do an optical packet switch network and to demonstrate an IP end-to-end -end path through an edge router and a core packet switch operating at uh, 40 gigabits per second and beyond. Uh, this demonstrator is expected to be ready by October this year. And in Germany, another similar project uh, is funded by the Ministry for Education, Science, Research and Technology. 
and the aim is to develop new system concepts for the efficient transport of IP traffic over optical and wireless networks. Now, most of this information can be found on the IST Optimist website. Uh, the latest CD that has the content of this website uh, can be found in the Terina booth. Uh, you probably have a copy already. But if you need any more information, you can contact the Optimist Consortium. And as I said already, in the Framework 6, in the new program, uh, there, there was a call for proposals for, with the objective broadband for all and BREAD, um, the initials mean broadband in Europe for all, a multidisciplinary approach, is the coordination action for these uh, projects. Uh, as the name implies, uh, the BREAD consortium believe that this broadband for all in Europe is going uh, to be achieved not only by a technology push, but uh, with a multidisciplinary approach, meaning that there are issues uh, um, at the society level, um, economical level, and uh, for so on. So here in this slide, you can see um, the, uh, how the research effort is being spread across different uh, domains in Europe, and you can see that there the main issue is the broadband access domain. So uh, in order to give a list of the bread objectives, um, the main objective is to develop a multidisciplinary review for the realization of broadband for all, and this will be achieved by combining forces and expertise at the technological level, economical and regulatory level. And uh, this will be done by identifying uh, obstacles at the European level, but also at the regional and national level, but even by sharing the best practices and transferring from one country to another in EU. Uh, these objectives are going to be achieved by organizing interdisciplinary workshops, uh, setting up an information exchange platform, uh, support consultation and networking, not only between IST projects, but also um, between IST and uh, regional initiatives, and uh, assist the dissemination of information uh, of the IST results. But uh, another main activity is uh, to create documents for good practice and also visioning documents uh, on evolutionary scenarios that provide a gap analysis between this vision and the um, state today. So the 17 projects that have already started in uh, this uh, broadband for all um, objective <coughs> um, are shown here. Uh, you can see that they are spread across the areas of wireless, broadband access, broadband fixed access, and core network, and they are funded under differ different instruments uh, like uh, IPs at the integrated projects, FETs, future and emerging technologies, etc. Networks of excellence, etc. Just to give a couple of examples about this project, uh, this is the MUSE. Uh, it means multi service access everywhere. It's an IP integrated project and it comprises 27 partners and it's led by Alcatel in Belgium. You can see that the uh, partners are system and component vendors, operators, research institutes and universities. And so the main aim is to, research, to do research and development of a low cost, full service broadband access and edge network for wireline and wireless applications. Uh, the key issues for this project is uh, low cost, first of all, have low CAPEX and OPEX, uh, multi-service and multi-hosting access, and have uh, uh, access everywhere, which means that uh, the technologies that are going to be developed in uh, MU should be able to reach more than 80% of uh, the European citizens. Uh, this is shown here uh, in this diagram. Uh, the effort that the MUSE project is going to put is in the um, in, uh, it, it's going to look into the access, uh, multiplexing, and aggregation of uh, uh, wireless and uh, wired networks in a way that is going to allow for low CAPEX and OPEX. So another project that has just started is the Nobel project. It's again a large integrated project with uh, 27 partners and is led by Telecom um, Italia. Uh, here, the project is going to deal more with the core and metro optical network, networks for end-to-end -end broadband services, and is going to look uh, into issues like efficient aggregation of access traffic, efficient metro and core transport, uh, uh, multi-service integration, automatic provisioning, etc. Um, in this slide, you can see uh, more of the issues that are going to be dealt uh, within the Nobel uh, project. 
So it's going to have like network studies, um, uh, design of transport, transport nodes, even uh, a testbed at the end with, uh, uh, for enabling technologies. And there are some issues like even optical uh, packet and bell switching that they are going to be um, discussed in the framework of this project. But one of uh, uh, the, you cannot see that very well, but uh, one of the uh, first things that the Nobel uh, wishes to do is uh, to create a benchmark for OPEX uh, cost for a European backbone. And for this uh, uh, reason, the University of Ghent has set up an online questionnaire and uh, is inviting every, anybody that is having any partial input uh, with respect to the OPEX to go and fill this uh, questionnaire online. If you or even communicate their views directly with email uh, with Sophie Ferbrus, but. Uh, I mean, if you are really interested, please let me know and I can give you this website because it's not very obvious. Now, uh, there is another instrument in the Framework 6 that it's a Networks of Excellence. And uh, in the area of optical networks, uh, uh, the, this Network of Excellence is called InPhoton 1. It's working towards bandwidth, manageability and cost efficiency. Uh, it uh, comprises 40 partners across Europe and it's led by Politecnico di Torino. It's going to deal with issues like core metro access and home networking. And these kinds of projects are actually supporting collaborative research between the partners, but also interaction with uh, non-EU partners. Again, uh, most of this information can be found on the IST Bread uh, um, portal. Uh, they are, uh, the Bread, the Bread uh, uh, Consortium is going to organize this Broadband Europe event in December in Bruges, Belgium, and you are all uh, welcome. So thank you very much for your kind attention. If there is anything um, you would like to ask. Mm -hmm. Yes, any questions? Sorry? Sorry. Yeah, we're just... Uh, point was being made about how the URLs are, the fonts got, yeah. The, the MUSE project, yeah. is it really all focused on connectivity or do you have application partners as well as I, the part of the consortium? Uh, I think it's on connectivity issues more. But uh, I mean, we probably <coughs> should ask the, you know, if there are some in the detail, you should probably ask the people that they are the coordinator. No, I can't. Is it better? I can't fix it. Oh the, oh, the survey, yeah. Uh, sorry. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. And, and I just want to remind people that, uh, again, fill out your evaluation forms, uh, turn them in after the plenary at the GRNet booth. And you, again, you will get a prize for turning in your evaluation form. So there is an incentive there. And now we will now go to a coffee break and we'll meet again in the main hall for session at 10, 10 a.m.